The Plant, A Steampunk Story, by Francis Rosenfeld. Chapter 4. He had to wait an entire week for an opportunity to visit the factory again. He anticipated with trepidation another one of his father's intrusions on his schedule, but when no restriction was placed on his time, he rushed back to his beloved factory to see what happened to it in the meantime. No wonder his father was impossible to please lately, the scene he came upon was simply surreal. The plant was growing in several locations now, immediately noticeable by anybody blessed with eyesight, it was as if spring had sprung in the factory and the pipe's leaf buds had started to open. The vine sneaked out of every crack and crevice, looking deceptively delicate, but harder to tear than tension cable, and then formed bridges and overpasses through the machine room, like a secondary system of sorts, bypassing the mechanical flow. It was pleasantly warm inside the room, although the heat had been turned off altogether, and it was the middle of November. Richard wondered how come the machinery was still working, because appearances led one to believe that plant invasion would put it into an unmanageable state, but he hadn't heard anything to suggest that, and during the previous week the puffing dragon had been billowing smoke like nothing ever happened. Since he had been unwise enough to mark up the plant's growth two weeks before, he went to check how it developed, which was kind of a futile activity, judging by the general appearance of the room. The plant was wrapping the entire pipe now, and just as last time it kept a weird distance from the metal, as if slightly repelled by an energy field. Richard couldn't figure out how it attached to its support, and had to conclude that it didn't. It seemed as if the plant used the pipe system as a background pattern and embroidered itself a separate, parallel motif, following the former but not touching it, except at the places where the two systems intersected. If he didn't know any better, Richard would think the plant was learning what proper flow patterns should look like from the pipe manifold, like a novice seamstress uses the pieces and parts of a well-fitting garment to cut patterns for a new one. He didn't delude himself that the green interloper was endowed with intelligence, not more than the average share of instinct and self-reliance nature dolls upon every living thing to ensure its survival. Forgetting for a moment that the presence of a random component in this well-planned environment, especially one that was stubbornly resistant and marched to the beat of its own drum, was a total disaster from the standpoint of system management, he took some time to study the plant's self-generated logic to figure out how it fit in. The first thing he noticed was that the vine's unbelievable resilience was supported by two basic features, its tension steel strength and its purposeful redundancy. Every one of the twisted ropes it wove around and through the pipes was fed by a myriad of strands coming from different directions, none of which was essential to the stability of the system, but all of whom contributed to it. Much like the circulatory system of an organism, it had minor pathways and major arteries, it didn't leave any spot uncovered and doubled down on itself at times to create secondary system loops. If there was one thing that was different about the pipes was that they looked shinier, as if brand new, and since this was evident throughout the system, it made Richard contemplate the possibility that the energy field, or whatever it was that held the plant around its supports, must have an inhibiting effect on corrosion, which was a blessing in the now warm and humid air, which would otherwise run havoc on metal components. Richard took a deep breath, and the large hall smelled like the forest, with none of the usual pungency of burnished metal and mechanical lubricants. How on earth do they keep this place running? Richard asked himself, flabbergasted by the impossible interdependence. It was at this time that he made the decision to abandon all his guilt-fueled scruples and self-imposed moral imperatives with respect to the plant, eliminate all preconceived notions about what was always not possible and just study its development, using no other assumptions than those made obvious by the environment itself. The first thing he noticed was that he couldn't see the roots of the plant anywhere, which could mean one of two things, it was either an epiphyte, if one wanted to envision the main manifold as a large pseudo tree, or its roots ran deep inside the underground portion of the system, out of sight and out of reach. The plant's ability to thrive in the steam pipes remained a mystery, a fact he just took as a given and decided to revisit later, when he had more information about it. It wasn't clear either if there was any logic to the entry and exit points, which seemed to be determined more by convenience than systemic concerns. He couldn't help notice that one of the green rope bridges had spanned between two remote sections of the manifold, allowing heat transfer between them, a feat the engineers had been trying to accomplish for years, only to be daunted by the costs. Richard remembered the myth of the salamander, who was fabled to make its nest in the fire, and really started wondering, despite his penchant for scientific proof, if there was any truth to that story, which up until this point he would have dismissed immediately as laughable. After all, there were many species adapted to extreme environments, who was to say that a plant can't withstand 240 degrees of steam pressure? Upon returning home, he found out that both of his parents had gone to a town meeting, no doubt to discuss the current dilemma. 
The meeting was open to the public, and even though the presence of a child would normally have been considered odd, Richard decided to go and fill in some of his information gaps. He tried to sneak into the balcony section unnoticed, an effort wasted on a couple of very squeaky floor planks and a heavy door whose hinges hadn't been oiled in years. Fortunately for him, the disturbance was drowned by the animated discussion below. What do you mean you tried to remove it? Trying is not a strategy. We expected you to resolve this problem by now. It's been three weeks, one man protested. How does the factory even stay functional? Surely the presence of a parasite of this size must be a major concern. What is the capacity that the factory can run at right now? An assertive lady asked from the first row. To tell you the truth, we had to double check to make sure we weren't crazy and ran it by several people for accuracy, but the plant's efficiency increased by 20% during the last month, the factory spokesperson replied. You still haven't answered my question, the assertive lady insisted. What capacity is the factory running at? Same as before, the spokesperson said. You didn't close any of the sections? Slowed down production? No. Does that seem like a reasonable approach to you under the circumstances? Surely you don't suggest we close down the plant, even briefly. Create hardship for people who are working hard, why don't you? A guy in the back protested, daunted by the prospect of unpaid idle time. No, we should all wait for the plant to shut itself down. Permanently, the lady protested sarcastically. The system needs a maintenance overhaul, at least, for safety, if nothing else. Please, people, there is no need for this kind of doomsday talk. The machines are running efficiently and we are in the process of finding a solution to the problem. Please bear with us as we're working on it, the spokesperson tried to appease the audience. But this should never have been allowed to become a problem in the first place, it is unthinkable. Who is responsible for this debacle? Don't tell me this stuff just happened, an elderly gentleman retorted, outraged. He's right. You guys let this happen on your watch. I don't see why the rest of us should be inconvenienced. I expect you to resolve the situation immediately and put things back the way they were before, a few people in the back protested vigorously. The long-suffering spokesperson took a second to picture the factory floor as it was reflected in the present moment, considered the amount of effort the management had already expended to remove the stubborn invader, and wondered if there was a combination of words in the English language that could present the state of fact in a way not conducive to public lynching. I can assure you that we're sparing no effort to remedy the situation in the shortest possible amount of time, he said convincingly, gaining more confidence as the roar in the audience subsided. Some way to spend the weekend, a man complained. Instead of enjoying time with my family. After the week I had. Nothing but problems all the time, he vented his frustration. He had been under pressure to deliver on a deadline by Friday, and the mere thought of the ubiquitous plant irritated him. Dude, what are you doing here? Jack's voice startled Richard. His friend was seated right behind him and seemed to have been there for a while. I could ask you the same question, Richard retorted, turning around to talk to his friend. Are you kidding me? How long has it been since something really cool happened in this town? I wouldn't miss it for the world. Especially considering that it may be related to, you know, he suggested, twitching his head sideways to get his point across. You're still on your alien theory, I take it. Richard asked. You mean you are not? What else could it be? Of course they are not going to tell us anything about it if it is, you know how these things go. But I decided to do a little bit of the research myself. Jack declared, secretively and with pride. He was a big fan of alien conspiracies and managed to insert them into every situation whose cause wasn't immediately obvious. Want to come with? I could use some help. Where are we going? Richard hesitated. Jack had this innate talent to get himself in trouble, even where there was no trouble to be found, and his ideas always had an unpleasant aftertaste, usually experienced in the form of school detention. He was, however, his best friend, and Richard didn't want to hurt his feelings, especially since the alien conspiracy theory was one of Jack's core beliefs. You're going to help me sneak into the lab. I want to see those analyses and reports myself, Jack replied eagerly. No, man. There is no way. Richard shook his head vigorously. What are you, crazy? If they catch us my dad will never let me out of my room. I'll be an old man before I am allowed to touch my game pad again. You know they won't catch us. 
Who cares about the stupid lab results, anyway, other than the two of us? The lab workers probably don't even want to think about their work over the weekend. Besides, nobody strolls through that part of town on a Saturday, he tried to persuade his friend. Life doesn't come with a lot of certainties, but Richard had pinpointed at least these three, death is inevitable, the sun always rises in the east and every time Jack tries to do something wrong, he gets caught. His heart squirmed like a worm on a hook, torn between his loyalty towards his friend and the anticipation of certain punishment. The last time he had joined in on one of Jack's adventures, the two of them had to repaint the school hallways and the physics lab, an endeavor which ruined their whole summer vacation. Oh, come on, man. You owe me this one. Remember how I covered for you three days ago in chemistry class? Jack upped the ante, piling up on the guilt. Seriously, Jack, a break-in. That's a misdemeanor, dude. Dad will kill me. I don't want to get mixed up in this, seriously. Richard held his ground. How chicken are you? When the aliens completely take over this town do you think anybody is going to care that you kept yourself out of trouble? We need to take our fate into our own hands, man. What if by the time they give us an explanation as of where the plant came from, it's already too late to do anything about it? Can you live with that burden? Jack exhausted his entire persuasive arsenal. The last thought resonated with Richard, who, having seen the actual rate of the plant's growth, knew that every minute counted. He was also dying to find out what kind of living thing that was, and had a passing command of biology he hoped would help him guess what the lab report said. I swear, if you get me in trouble, I'll never speak to you again. You're such a chicken. Who's going to catch us? Jack replied, happy to have convinced him. The security guard, for one. Richard started enumerating. Who? Old Johnny Cakes. Jack pointed out that good old John earned this nickname because he always fell asleep after eating that specific breakfast item. The police, Richard continued. What are they going to do in that area? Squirrels pass through it and get bored to death. Nothing ever happens there. Not over the weekend. We might run into somebody we know. Richard tried the last resort. Come on, Ricky, you should be able to come up with something better than that, man. Jack taunted him, knowing how much his friend loathed being called Ricky. I already know I'll regret this, you hear me? You always get caught, dude, and I always get stuck with detention because of you, he protested, really annoyed by the diminutive. This is why your life is so boring, you never take any chances. You would grow mold if I wasn't here to shake you out of your complacency. Don't tell me that summer painting the school corridors wasn't the best time you ever had in your life. Jack kicked him in the ribs. No, it wasn't. I wanted to build a water-powered automaton. Richard protested. Oh, God. Jack said, visibly disappointed. You definitely need to get out more, dude. As luck has it, I'm here to help.